Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. As I'm going along, if you start to enjoy what you are hearing, we would love to have you as part of the family. All you simply have to do is please hit that subscribe button and make sure your notification bell is set to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time a video is uploaded. Also, if you are interested in becoming a subscriber, all of that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Creepy Let's Not Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I came from Starbucks and decided to get some batteries for my TV remote. So I stopped at the dollar store, parked and went inside. It was normal until a OG pimp decided to catcall me and say, Hey, sexy lady. I ignored him and walked to the toothpaste. I needed that too. He then says, What? You can't say hi? So I said hi and proceeded to look at the toothpaste. He then says some gibberish and goes into the checkout line, of course, holding it up because the dollar store is ghetto as fuck. Finally, I found the toothpaste I was looking for and turned the corner to the batteries. I looked for a minute and I turned to see him second in line. Okay, cool. He forgot about me. He didn't. I get in the line behind a guy that's nicely dressed and the lady is standing behind me. This OG pimp is looking at me the entire damn time. He then stops, says he forgot something, and comes right towards me. As he passes me, he touches my shoulder while saying, I like you. And in my head, I'm saying, what the hell? I don't like your ass, get off me. He then grabs what he needed and walks to the line when people were complaining he was taking too long. He gets back into the line and again stares at me. The lady finally checks out his things. He grabs his stuff and then looks at me again. He does the two finger, I'm looking at you gesture. Finally, he leaves. I thought it was all over. Unknowingly, I passed by his car while I was going to mine and I hear a beep beep. Hey, 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 can I get your number? You all, this guy waited for me in his car, so I yelled back, uh, no. And he responds with, why can't we be friends? I told him, because I'm not interested, sorry. I get in my car, he backs up, and leaves. He goes to the left, and I go to the right. I drove down to KFC by my house to make sure I didn't see him again, as I didn't want to lead him to my house, if... He was following me. When it was clear to take off, I headed back home. All I wanted was some toothpaste and batteries. What the hell? And I was wearing a ugly, ugly ass outfit as I didn't have plans to actually get out except for just the toothpaste. Literally, I was wearing a hoodie, jeans and sketchers. Span away is ghetto man. Don't move here. Disclaimer, the reason I didn't cuss him out was because there were babies standing behind him and I didn't want to scare them from an uncomfortable situation, so I kept my cool. But I promise you, I wanted to freak the hell out on him, as this just had happened at the park last week on me. Short ladies, be wary. I'm 27 and I know I look pretty freaking young but men will take advantage of this shit, and it's not cool by any means. Please, stand your ground while you are out and about. For context, this happened when I was 17. I'm now 18, and this was right before I turned 18. 
I was on a lot of apps to help me make friends as I'm autistic and struggle making friends in real life. I'm femme and non-binary and also asexual. So, because of the nature of these apps, I stated that I was asexual in my bio. I also stated other things like my interests. Then I met this guy who lived like an hour away and I was looking for a friend to smoke with and he said he would. I know I was very naive. Nonetheless, we planned a time and I waited outside for him. He brought me a breeze and we took turns hitting his cart. We had very meaningful, deep conversations. We immediately just clicked, which I thought was amazing. Well, until a bit later, when I was very high, because I'm impulsive and don't know my limits very well. It was getting very cold, and I told him I should get back inside, and he agreed, and started to walk me towards my window. I was stumbling, unable to see straight. Once in my driveway, I asked for a hug before he left and me, thinking it was kind of cute, did give him a hug. Then, next thing I know, he was behind me. He had a knife to my neck. At first, I tried to fight back, but realized that was getting nowhere. Fighting back even severely hurt me. In the heat of the moment, I thought I was going to become just another true crime murder story. So, I started listening to him. I was hoping he'd spare my life but at the time, was trying to leave as much evidence as possible, just in case listening didn't get me out of it. And it didn't. Then I saw scars on his thighs. I managed to appeal to some sort of humanity he had in him. My exact words were, I saw your scars. You're just like me. You're hurting, but this isn't going to stop the hurt only temporarily soothe it. I don't know how I was able to think so logically in such a panic state, but it ended up being what saved me. He ended up letting me go until I agreed to meet him again. So I agreed, then went inside, and tended to my cut thumb. Then I blocked him on everything and kept his chats on my phone just in case I was ever brave enough to go to the police. Obviously, I didn't meet up with him again and never will. What scares me most is how much we had in common with our mentality and personality. It's scary. I know predators like to say stuff they don't mean, but our deep convos felt so real. Anyway, please listen to my advice, everyone, and don't ever meet someone from online that isn't in a public place. It was October 29, 2023, and we were all 15. About two weeks before, I had organized a Halloween mashup with my three childhood friends at my house, which is pretty isolated, set far away from the city, and near some empty farms. It's been a tradition every year to invite my friends over to camp out in a tent outside my house. But this time, I wanted to add some extra excitement. For privacy, I'll call my friends Ray, G, and Adam. Ray was the funny, tall, and average-built one. G was shorter, but super chill. The kind of friend you could always relax with. Adam was my best friend childhood friend, that is. We'd hung out almost every day each summer since we were 10 and had been in the same classes for six straight years. They planned to arrive at around 2 p.m., and we aimed to head out to our camp at around 4 p.m. Ray and Adam arrived first, so we set up snacks, packed our backpacks, and just joked around like any other 15-year-olds. We planned to get to the camp area using a couple of motorized bicycles and my dirt bike. I had my dirt bike, Adam had his own motorized bicycle, and I also had a second bike that Ray could use. But soon, we realized that Adam's bike had a busted clutch cable. We spent a while trying to fix it, but we only made things worse. 
By the time G showed up at around 3.30, we had to adjust our plan. We decided that I'd take G on the dirt bike, Adam would ride my other bike, and Ray would wait back at my house, which I made a return trip to pick him up once we got the other set up at camp. The area was about eight kilometers away, requiring to cross a quiet highway and then follow a bumpy, gravelly farm road. This camp area wasn't anything official, just a flat spot in the middle of a field where I liked to go chill and clear my thoughts. By the time G and I arrived, it was almost already getting dark, so I rushed back to get Ray. When we finally all gathered at the spot, G and Adam had already set up the firewood and hadn't lit the fire yet. It was pitch black and the place felt eerier than usual. We got the fire going and started grilling sausages, enjoying the solitude. The area is always empty. No one ever uses that road. Then, out of nowhere, we saw a helicopter fly over us. We laughed nervously, wondering if they'd spotted the fire, thinking it was some sort of cult gathering. About three minutes later, we saw car headlights off in the distance, maybe two kilometers away. The car seemed to just be sitting there with its lights on. But after a few moments, it turned them off. We thought it was weird, but didn't give it too much thought. Then we noticed a massive tractor, one of those with crop cutting blades in front, slowly moving through a field about 200 meters away. We didn't think of it at first, but then it started heading straight towards us. We quickly moved our bikes and bags out of the way, but the tractor kept getting closer, like it had no intention of stopping. At the last second, I grabbed our helmets and moved them just before the tractor rolled over the fire, extinguishing it. Then, it stopped right there, turning off its lights, and just stood there. It was pitch black, and we couldn't see inside the cab. We all stood there, creeped out, wondering why it would almost run us over, and then just stop. The tractor stayed in place for what felt like an eternity. None of us could see a thing inside, and the thought that someone was just sitting there silently watching us gave us chills. Finally, I told everyone to pack up as fast as possible. Two of my friends somehow squeezed onto the back of my dirt bike, and Adam got onto the motorized bike. We sped off, with one of my friends clinging on and nervously looking back. He said the tractor was still just sitting there in the dark, without its lights on, as we got about a hundred meters away. After a tense, silent ride, we finally made it back home and about 20 minutes later. We tried to brush it off, only mentioning it once, but the whole experience left us shaking. Now, thinking back, I can't help but wonder what the driver's intentions were. Why would someone drive so close to us, extinguishing our fire, then just sit there in silence? I keep imagining that while we were staring into that dark cab, Maybe the driver had already slipped out of the tractor, silently watching us from behind one of the wheels, hidden in the shadows, just a few steps away for about a straight five minutes. The thought still sends chills down my spine. Oh, and I shouldn't mention, this just happened a few hours ago. I hate leaving my own comments after a story, you all, but being watched or in that same position someone watching you from the shadows that you can't see like that, that kind of shit makes me scared. It literally scares the crap out of me. So anyway, I hope you all enjoyed that story because it kind of freaked me out a little bit at the end. <laughs> Back to our stories. Last year, me and my ex were living in a cottage with our son and my stepson. We lived on a property where the landlords were right there. We get along great. Their son was a friend of mine, and my father went to high school with the landlords. The lady had her brother living with them, who is on the spectrum, but it's more like he's just awkward. 
I've had suspicions of someone in our house because we would notice things moved around and drawers open. I would always be missing money and all my change was gone. That started many arguments between us because I thought she was stealing my change and cashing it in. And it was all silver coins that I've been collecting for years. My ex thought I was stealing money out of her car, and I thought she was taking it out of mine. Sometimes she would wake me up in the middle of the night saying she just heard what sounded like footsteps upstairs, which is the main floor, by the way. I would get up and look and didn't see anybody. This happened a few times. Sometimes when my ex would get home early from work, she said she would hear the downstairs door close, but didn't see anyone outside. I've come home from work early, around noon, when everybody knows we are normally at work, until around 5. One day, I came home, and the landlord's brother was sitting on my front steps. I said, what's up? What are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just sitting. I just got the mail, was dropping it off to you. I literally grabbed the mail out of the box on my way in, and we have separate mailboxes, so it's not like it was mixed in with theirs. I told him, don't be creeping around up here. Don't need you on the steps in my area when I get home from work. One time, everybody was down by the pool, and I came home and yelled down to everyone that I'm going to barbecue for them. Where I was standing, I can see into the room where their step-grandfather was staying, and he is loaded. Always has a wad of cash, $10,000 or more with him. When I yelled down, I heard a commotion and seen him closing drawers and run out of the room and came outside, and the creep lit a smoke. I could tell he was shaking in his boots, thinking he got caught. I told Grandpa he was in there and he lost it on him. Okay, now for the really creepy part. I have told the landlord that her brother has been snooping in my house, and now I caught him snooping in their house for money as well. We have been out there for a year now, and he started messaging my ex on Facebook trying to talk to her. She ignored him for a while, and he kept video calling her, and she wouldn't answer, and then blocked him. He found her Insta, her TikTok, and every other platform and kept messaging her. She finally answered and asked if everything was okay. He started confessing his love to her, saying he wants to see her and my son. He said, I have your panties and leggings. He told her, I'm on my way home from work and I'm going to put your underwear on and watch porn. She said, what the fuck are you talking about? How do you have my underwear? He told her that he could sneak into the house and go through her stuff. What the actual fuck? There was times she would call me after I went to work and ask if I'm there because she would hear the door open as she was in the shower. He started sending screenshots of his phone showing her that he has her as his background because of how much he loves her and that he likes to put her leggings on and jerk off to her pictures. While living there, the landlord's kid, his nephew, was telling us how he hears him jerking off in his room with porn playing so loud and him screaming her name as he beat off. He didn't really believe it at first, but now, holy shit creepy. He was working at a farm that is also a doctor's office. He was fired because he was sneaking into the house and watching this girl that lived there sleeping. Also because he was apparently creeping on children in the playground at the doctor's. And he had no reason to be over there when his job was on the other side of the property. What a freaking creep. He told my ex that he has 13 articles of her clothing that he took from her as well. And he is very proud of it. Told her he has undies and clothing from other women that rented the cottage as we did. He thought that this was okay and would somehow make my ex attracted to him. He started asking for her address so that he could send her stuff back to her, saying, Why do you hate me, baby? I'm in love with you. I can do everything you like. 
I've seen how he F's you, but I can do it so much better. Like what in the actual hell? He was watching us getting it on. He was watching us sleep. My son slept in the room with us. He was a newborn in that house and were there until he was three before we moved. My stepson had his own room, which had a door to the outside, so he would have to walk through his room to get to ours. My stepson was uncomfortable, saying that he hears things at night on the window, and that sometimes the window would open by itself. She is going to bring all the stuff that he texted to her, and admitted to doing to other people to the cops. He needs to be stopped. I wished I could post the screenshots of the messages on here to show you all it's all true. There's my story. What the hell do we do next? I don't need this guy trying to creep on my ex and my son. It truly is very unsettling. So to the creepy kid that made our lives a living hell, I hope we never ever see you again. Two separate but equally creepy and scary incidents. Hello, fellow listeners. This is my first time writing the story down, so please bear with me. Before I've shared my two creepiest, scariest encounters that still send shivers down my spine to this day. Be safe out there, everyone. Here we go. Number one. I was in my early 20s in graduate school spending a lot of late nights studying with friends on campus. One night, I left school to head back home after a long study session. It was a little past midnight. About two-thirds of the way home, I realized that I needed to pump gas because my gas tank was pretty much empty. Fast forward a few minutes later, I was at the gas station I frequented often that was nearby my home. I was the only one pumping gas there no one else around. I was done and just waiting for my receipt to print out, when out of nowhere this middle-aged lady popped up in front of me. She had no car with her. She asked me for a favor. I had an uneasy sense from her from the get-go. You know, I just got really bad vibes from her, so I slowly started to back away from her and reaching for my car door handle. So, she states she needs a ride to her place that's not too far away. Meanwhile, kept looking in the direction of the dark side of the gas station building with no light. I asked her if she had a family member she could call to come pick her up, or if I could call her a cab, but she chose to ignore my questions, insisting on me giving her a ride. I told her that I was in a rush and had no time and needed to leave right now. Then, immediately proceeded to jump in my car, lock all the doors, and drive away. You know how sometimes you come across some people and they just give you a bad gut feeling that you just can't quite pinpoint and shake off? Well, that was definitely the case here. I'm pretty sure the ride she needed was a ruse to get both of us in my car where she'd probably pull out some sort of hidden weapon on me, ordering me to take her to her accomplices, who were hiding by the gas station building to kidnap me, and subsequently rob me, even potentially murdering me. That's the only thing that makes me sense about this very strange, uncomfortable encounter. After that night, I never went back to that gas station, and also never pumped gas alone late in the evening. And number two, I had a pup that I would take out several times a day, including late in the evenings before heading to bed. Our neighborhood was pretty safe, and it never crossed my mind that I'd ever run into a scary situation like the one I did that one night. So, I'm walking my dog down the street, and we stopped by his favorite tree so he can tinkle. As he is doing so, out of the corner of my eye, I see a darkened figure coming our way. I turned around to see a tall male figure with a lowered hoodie over his head, 
starting to pick his pace up towards me. Right then, my pup started barking intensely in his direction. So, I pick up my dog and start running towards my house. I got a really bad feeling about this guy, who was, at this point, starting to run as well. I safely made it back to my house, around the corner, locked the door and turned off all the light, discreetly peeking out from behind the curtain to see if I could see him. He is basically standing there in the middle of the street across my house, intensely looking around for who I presume was me. Then, after walking back and forth and looking around for a while, he finally left. He seemed to be pretty aggravated. I was so scared that I was shaking. I'm pretty sure he saw a lone female in the dark and thought he'd take advantage of that opportunity. Thankfully, not long after, we ended up moving away. But this disturbing occurrence stayed with me and still gives me the chills. God knows what would have happened to me if he had, in fact, caught up with me. So, to the crazy lady and to that weird guy with the hoodie, I don't ever want to see or meet you ever again. It was autumn in 2015. I was 23 years old of which now I'm 31. During that time, I lived in Lancaster as I was studying at Lancaster University. For those who may not be familiar, Lancaster is a small and rather quaint town in the north of England. As a student, you could either live at the university campus or in private accommodation in the town. I had decided to live in a newly built, renovated apartment in a nice side of town and yes, it was quite expensive. I had already been studying for two years and had reached my third year. By this time, I had grown accustomed to the layout of the town and felt comfortable and safe living there, semi-independently, with two other friends who were also studying at the university. Since my first year, I had decided to improve my fitness by taking nightly runs around either the campus or the town. As we were living in the town center by my third year, I would run either with my housemate or alone. The important thing to note about Lancaster, and this will be important later, is that it has quite a large residential area that is hilly and far removed from the bustling center which at that time was a hub for students or the local northern folk, probably drinking in pubs and eating pies. Occasionally, I would run into my housemate, however. I preferred to run alone and listen to some kind of heavy metal, a big fan of death tones during that period. On this particular day, as I said, a chilly autumnal evening, I had decided to run alone. It was about 8 p.m., and I had my earphones in. I had started to run up to the more isolated district that led up to a very pretty residential area and a large green called Williamson Park. It had a butterfly museum at the top of the hill. Next to the park was a very large graveyard, the kind that is miles wide and had different areas. Large yew trees, crumbling graves, a crypt in the center overrun with leaves and ivy. What was especially creepy about this particular cemetery was that it had the ruin of an old mental asylum or hospital at the other side. You could actually sneak in if you walked across the width of the cemetery and crawled through a small hole in the fence that led to the asylum grounds. This was not advised, though, as guard dogs roamed the derelict building. It was not a place you wanted to be during the night, that's for sure. So I had made my way past Williamson Park and up to the entrance of the graveyard. Immediately, my eye was drawn to something small standing at the imposing gates of the graveyard. They were kind of tall, black iron gates that were at the bottom of a little winding path. 
I felt a little apprehensive, but it wasn't unusual to see people walking their dogs, etc. out of the graveyard, so I started to slow my pace to a walk in the direction of the shape. As I grew nearer, I realized that the shape was a child at around 9 to 10 years of age, and they were running towards me frantically. They looked panicked and scared. I think they were crying. I vividly remember that the girl was not wearing a coat, only a thin dress that would not be suitable for the harsh Lancastrian autumn. She asked me if I could help her. She was desperate and seemed to be frightened of something. She kept looking back into the graveyard, which at this point was totally pitch black beyond the gates. I mean, there was absolutely no light beyond the path. As the graveyard was quite large, it was chilling to see the depth of the blackness and the vulnerable child standing at the mouth of the gate, helpless. I don't recall what the girl said exactly, but I then offered to call the local police. I had typed triple nine into my phone and had it on loudspeaker. The girl immediately changed. She was not happy about the fact I was calling the police. That was quite clear. She stopped crying, and she seemed angry, almost demanding, and insisted she did not need the police to help. I reassured her that it was the best to inform the police, even offered to walk her to the station, which was about 20 minutes back down the hill. This is where the story gets weird and a little terrifying. The girl turned and ran back into the graveyard. She ran directly through the gates into the eerie blackness. She didn't even turn back, just ran as quickly as she possibly could until she had completely disappeared. It was then totally silent. I was spooked beyond belief, now standing in a darkened street, completely alone. I had so many questions. Who was the girl? Why was she alone? Why was she scared of the police? Why wasn't she frightened of the dark? Who might she be running to, or rather, from? I turned and ran all the way back down the hill, not stopping until I had reached a well-lit, built-up area. It's safe to say I didn't run on my own at all at night again. Anyway, it's a mystery that has plagued me ever since. Little girl in the graveyard... Let's definitely not meet again. This took place about 10 years ago. I had recently moved into a lovely house owned by a very nice couple who were rarely home. The house was large and they were renting out two of the rooms for financial purposes and also just to have people there to look after the house since they were rarely there. Pretty quickly after I moved in, they found another occupant, Hannah, which is not a real name. Now, this is one of those always trust your instinct lessons. I could tell that something was very off with Hannah from quite literally the moment I met her. I can't describe what caused me to have that feeling because she really came across as normal, but it was just something I felt right away. However, at that particular time in my life, I was a really wild and self-destructive person, so it would only be appropriate that Hannah and I became really fast friends. We were very quickly partying together all the time. As soon as Hannah began drinking, she turned into a very angry person, not meaning to come across as judgmental because I was no angelic drunk myself. But her behavior was completely over the top. She had recently come out of a relationship and had a lot of anger towards her ex. One night in particular, I don't even know if we'd been drinking, she asked me to go somewhere with her. I said, sure, where? To visit a friend of hers. We went to an apartment complex I wasn't familiar with. I asked her who we were going to visit, and she did not answer. She parked and walked towards a window and began to look inside. She didn't knock on the window. She just stood there. 
She was watching the people inside the apartment. It was her ex and his new girlfriend. I don't remember how I realized who that was, to be frank. I freaked out and begged her to leave, but before we could leave, it was too late. He saw us and demanded we leave or he'd call the police, so we left. Dumb me at the time decided that wasn't enough to end the friendship. I was 22, lesson learned. Hannah was always kind of evasive on how she made money, but I learned she was making money from men she had met on the internet. I'm not judgmental of that, however. She'd often make comments on how I could easily make money from the same website she used. I told her it just was not my thing. One night, she asked me to go with her to the bar for a drink, a bar we didn't usually go to. I said, sure. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. She quickly finds a table where an older, extremely unattractive gentleman was seated. I quickly realized what happened. She recruited me for a date. I demanded we leave. There were other way crazier than you could imagine things that also happened, but that would be too identifying. However, we both moved out and it became clear I needed to cut off all contact. Her behavior became dangerous. Fast forward to now. She's reached out to me several times on social media, begging me to come back into her life, saying she has no other friends. She's pretended to be other people, then begging me to come back into Hannah's life, even though I know it's Hannah herself talking. I've told her to stop contacting me, that I would reach out to law enforcement to no avail. I'm a fixation to her. She even at one point reached out to my parents making up lies about me. The contact ceased for a few years until a few weeks ago. I get a message request on Facebook Messenger, not knowing who it was at first. Hannah now goes by another name. I accepted the request and quickly received a very long message. It was Hannah, having sent a bizarre message relaying an incident to me that never happened. An incident where I was in distress and she was a grandois hero. It simply never happened. I didn't respond and blocked her immediately, of course. I then began to do a little digging, which I should have done years ago, by the way, and realized everything was a lie. Everything she relayed to me, from where she was initially from to where she graduated, was a lie. Even her damn real name was a lie. Oh, and that's not all. The same day, I received a message from a guy she used to date when we lived together, asking, Have you talked to Hannah? I don't want to bring up the message she sent me, so I said, No, not in years. He responded, saying she had recently sent him a bizarre message. He we'll just call him Joe, told me the last time he spoke to her was 10 years ago when she traveled to his home state and tried to find him so they could hang out. Joe said he purposefully avoided her and they never met up. The freaky part about all of this? I remember that trip. I remember her going saying Joe had asked her to come see him and she couldn't wait. When she had come back from the trip, she was so happy and said she was hesitant to actually meet up with Joe at first, but he begged her to come see him, and they had a great time hanging out like two old friends. I was flabbergasted and freaked out to the core. I still am. Hannah was a good person, but struggled with mental illness, and I can't help but feel sympathy for her. But, also, her behavior is frightening to me, especially since I seem to be a fixation. It's now making sense why she never seemed to have other friends. I'm considering contacting law enforcement to get a VPO, but I don't know if this even warrants that. Still trying to figure it out. So, Hannah, or whatever your name is, let's not ever meet again.
This isn't something I would normally write and post for everyone to see, and I hope I don't regret it somehow. I saw someone briefly mention something in a YouTube video and thought it would be the perfect place to share my story of a horrific thing that happened to me. A story I've never told anyone. I'm not sure if anyone will see this, but I'm sharing in hopes that it will inspire someone to stay safe, safer than I was. I'm not sure if trigger warnings are needed or suggested here, but just out of consideration for others, I'd like to warn everyone that I will be briefly mentioning sexual assault with as little details as possible. One year ago, around this time, I was bored and scrolling the web, nothing unusual for me, when I decided to go on Omegle. Omegle was a, now shut down, website that allowed you to talk to strangers via video or text chat. It was around for a long time, and I used it frequently when I was younger, as a time waster. There were plenty of creeps on there, sure, but I've had an equal amount of pleasant interaction and conversations on the site. On Omegle, you could type in tags, basically keywords that describe the type of conversation or person that you're looking for, and you would match someone with the same ones. I always use ALT for alternative. I feel like it weeded out a lot of rude people and connected me to more appropriate people my age. For reference, I was 19 at the time. I connected with someone who called himself Kane, and we started chatting via text. He said he was 23, and I said my age back. We exchanged some small talk, and before I knew it, we were talking all night and I do mean all night. We lived in the same time zone, and I stayed up until 6 a.m. chatting about philosophy and life and our interests, just because he was entertaining and I was having fun. When we were talking about our general areas that we lived in, he said abruptly, we should meet up sometime. I laughed, but it turns out he was serious and it seems like we only lived three to four hours away from each other. So he was really considering this. I am an anxiety-ridden person, but for whatever reasons, I thought that he might be normal due to the fact that I just spent hours and hours talking to him, and I didn't pick up any red flags. So I said, sure, why the hell not? I know, I know. This is an incredibly stupid mistake. I have a big heart, though, and frequently make the mistake of giving others the benefit of the doubt. So, just like that, we started planning a camping trip. He was set on doing it days after that morning because that was when he was off work next. I agree because I didn't have anything to do at that time. I asked for his number so we could talk somewhere else other than Omegle about the trip. He gave it to me. I texted it and noticed the messages show green on my iPhone. This indicated that he was using a Samsung or an Android. Teasingly, I said something along the lines of, What's up with the Samsung? After a few minutes, he texted back saying that he had two phones and that one was for work. This was the first red flag that went off in my head. Why would he need two phones for work at his age? I mean, of course, there's possible reasons, but it just set off that intuitive feeling. One that I regret not listening to. I asked what his job was, and he said that he worked for the state. He added that he isn't allowed to share details about his job because he signed papers saying he wouldn't and that he could get fired if he were to violate this agreement. I was still weary of this, but I just figured he worked for a police station or the town council, or something to do with law enforcement, and that I was probably overthinking it. Days passed, and the date for our camping trip approached quickly. He wanted to take me someplace close to where he lives, Nimham Mountain in New York. Don't worry, this isn't near my house at all, and I don't give a fuck about violating his fake privacy 
after what he took from me. Obviously, I wanted to do at least a little research about where I was going, so I popped the name into Google. A bunch of results popped up about the soil on Nimham Mountain being contaminated with arsenic due to the old mines in the area. All of the government and state articles I read said that it was still safe to hike there and that you should wash your skin and shoes after hiking. I still had a feeling of unease about the whole thing. I texted Kane and asked him why we were going to some place that could potentially be dangerous. He assured me that nothing would happen and said he chose the spot because it's somewhere him and his friends frequently camp. This slightly reassured me. He does know the area better than me, after all. My parents are definitely over-suspicious of everyone. Strict is also a safe word. For good reason, though. They are just protective. I told him that I was meeting up with a friend I met over a video game and that I already known him for a month. I knew this would be less likely to freak him out than the truth. They were adamant that this was a horrible idea, but finally let me go off when Kane pulled into my driveway. He didn't come inside and waited outside in his car for me. After a brief introduction, my mom rushed out to meet him and ask a few questions about the area we were headed to, and then we were off. We pulled into the Starbucks by my house so he could get a coffee since he was tired from the drive up. We sat in his car for about an hour and a half afterwards. During that time, he asked me to rate the playlist he put on and showed me how he writes down every single song he likes in a little notebook he kept in his car. I thought that was weird, but kind of sweet. Like, what guy these days writes down songs? After an hour or so passed, I told him we should get going so we can get to the campsite before dark. He kept saying, just five more minutes. After about 30 minutes of insisting we need to leave to make it on time, he finally let us start onto the road. While we drove the four hours up to our destination, Kane mostly talked about himself. He told me long stories about his friends and a girl that he used to date that he didn't like. I thought that was strange. Who talks about another woman to a girl like this? After telling stories for about two hours, I tried to deviate to a brighter topic and ask what kind of things he was into, hobby-wise. I already knew the stuff he told me online, but I was trying not to suffer from awkward silence or any more of his weird ramblings. He said that he thinks that eating healthy is important and that people who eat junk food are stupid. He also says he only wears sustainable clothing that's made from cotton or wool. I don't think I have a problem with being sustainable, but he was saying it in a really obnoxious way. Then he turned to me and asked the first question about me since we got in the car. What brought you to Omega? I told him that I was bored and that I like meeting new and interesting people, and that was about it. He nodded slowly and thought and grinned, showing the most expression I've seen on his face so far. He said he likes to go on Omega and tell people that he's a soldier in Russia, and that he was torturing people as he spoke to them. I sat there in silence and just kind of stared at him, waiting for him to say that it was just some kind of fucked up sense of humor and he was just kidding. But he didn't. He just laughed and said, What? As we neared the campsite, I mentioned that I was getting kind of hungry. He said that we can stop at Whole Foods before going to camp that night. In my head, I sighed about this, knowing he was probably going to judge me for whatever I picked out there. But it wasn't a problem for me, and I was hungry, so I agreed. In Whole Foods, he made me pay for both of our meals because his card wouldn't work there. He didn't even try. This annoyed me, but I was just eager to get to Cam, so I paid and we sat outside and ate. After about an hour, we were finally ready to get to camp. 
We drive up the mountain and he pulls into a small parking area with about three spots. Cars were parked there and older men were surrounding the cars smoking weed. Nothing they were doing was wrong, at least morally to me, but it just made me uncomfortable that they were there so late at night. Before I could even mention it, Kane says that it's too cold for him to carry our supplies to the campsite, which was about a 10 minute walk, and set up camp. I was taken aback by this. I said, um, what do you mean? I'll help you. We didn't come up here for nothing. He insisted and told me to get out of the car to feel how cold it was. He said it would take a while to pitch our tent and that it was too much for us. There was no way that I was getting out of the car and facing the men in the parking spot next to us. So I rolled down the window halfway, stuck my hand out. It was freezing. He was right about that. That night it was in the 30s and the wind chill felt worse being higher up. I was annoyed, but I agreed to sleeping in his car for the night. It was sad that our trip was basically wasted. He sat in silence for a while, seemingly uncomfortable that I was annoyed and unsure of how to comfort me. I slinked back in the passenger seat and started to scroll on social media, trying to pass the time. He grabbed my phone out of my hand and said, Come here. He patted his lap. I was already annoyed at the situation and confused on what he thought he was doing. I said, <laughs> You're funny, and reached for my phone. That he had tossed onto the floor of the car. Before I could get to it, he reached over and scooped me up out of the seat and tossed me onto the back seats. He then proceeded to sexually assault me. I don't remember most of it. My eyes were squeezed shut, and I was praying for it to end. After it was done, he pushed me back into the seats and got dressed. He smiled at me and said, How was it? I just stared back at him with tears in my eyes. He climbed back into the front seat, propped his feet up on the wheel, and went to sleep. I didn't know what to do. I sat there motionless in the back seat for about two hours trying to process what had just happened to me. I considered calling my mom, calling 911. I thought about it for what felt like forever. I already had been assaulted once in my life and it broke my parents' hearts. I knew that learning of this would absolutely destroy them. And I was also afraid of what would happen if I told them. I didn't want my dad or brother to go to jail for life because they were angry and got revenge against this guy. So I just sat there all night, watching the men outside stare into the car and smoke on their joints. I don't remember falling asleep, but eventually I woke up to wind hitting the car. I was in a fetal position, sitting upright, holding my legs with my arms. Kane noticed that I was awake and said that it was time to go. I was so scared of him. It felt like my heart was leaping out of my throat. Adrenaline was pumping through my body and started scanning the back seat and our overnight bags for something I could use as a weapon in case he were to pursue me again. I ended up holding on to my full metal water bottle. It wasn't deadly by any means, but it could knock someone out, and holding it made me feel safer. I stayed in the back seat, and Kane started driving. I asked where we were going, and he said, to get breakfast. Almost as if it were obvious, and it was silly of me to ask. After driving down the mountain back into the city, we pulled into a parking garage, and he tells me to get out, that we're here. I get out of the car and cling close to it, not wanting to let him get behind me. I was thinking about making a run for it, but didn't want to risk getting chased and overpowered by him. I followed him to a little Mexican spot on the corner, and he told me to order pancakes. 
so he could have some. This obviously made me more pissed than I already was, but I didn't say anything because I was afraid there would be consequences. If I showed negative emotions at this point, I ate a few bites of my food, and he happily ate the rest of my plate. He paid quickly with cash and took me back to the car, where he lay down in the back seat. He said he was going to take a nap because he didn't sleep well last night. I didn't want to argue with him, so I let him sleep. How could he sleep so soundly after what he had done to me? He slept for about three hours. The whole time I was watching YouTube videos trying to calm myself down and keep a clear mind. It was around 9 a.m. and around this time my mom was waking up and texting me saying she wants me home. I told her that Kane was taking a nap and that I would be home soon. She didn't like the sound of that and insisted I come home. I was happy to have a reason to get the fuck out of there. One that might be convincing to Cain. I woke him up and he became angry with me saying, Don't wake me up next time. Play on your phone. Watch TikTok or something. I was shaking but I managed to say that my mom wanted me home and that we needed to go. He said to let him sleep for 30 more minutes and told me to set a timer on my phone. That I did. 30 minutes felt like 30 hours, and once it went off, I woke him up once again. This time, I filmed myself waking him up because I was afraid of what he was going to do. He was angry once again, and I told him that 30 minutes was up. I asked to leave, begged him to leave, and he said no. Over and over, he said we aren't leaving yet. I was shaking uncontrollably, but put on a brave face and pretended like I was being playful. I said, okay, I'll just get an Uber then. I turned around and started to open the car door when I felt his hand grab my shoulder and dig into it, yanking me back into place. I honestly think I blacked out of fear for a few seconds. He said, what the fuck are you doing? His hand was still on my shoulder his fingers squeezing into my skin. My mind was racing, and I was on the verge of tears. This caught his eye, and I quickly played it off by saying my mom would call the police to come get me if I wasn't home soon. I had mentioned earlier that my dad works in law enforcement, so this was a little bit more believable of a lie. At the mention of police, something changed in his face. He looked frantic. He let go of me and unhappily agreed to drive me home. I felt a deep relief, the deepest relief I've ever felt, and swallowed the lump in my throat as he climbed into the front seat and started our five-hour drive back to my house. The drive back was much quieter than the drive up. I didn't say anything unless he initiated I just gripped my phone in my hand and tried not to make eye contact with him. I wondered if he had any remorse for what he did in those moments. When he reached the town where I live, it was 11.30 at night. Kane pulled into the main strip to get to my house and I saw flashing lights behind me. My first instinct was to be scared shitless because my dad is a cop. So, I've always made extra sure not to break any traffic laws. The police pulled us over, and two men stepped out of the police car. I frantically rolled down my window so they could see my familiar face, the daughter of their boss. One of them greeted me and looked both concerned and disappointed that I was in the car with someone getting pulled over. The other cop told Kane to get out of the car while I explained what we were doing out so late. I spared the illegal and horrific details. I was tired, scared, and I needed to be safe in my own home. I also didn't want them waking up my sleeping dad with such bad news. I overheard the second officer ask Kane about his info, which he said, What's your name, son? Kane mumbled, and he said to speak up. 
The name he gave was not Kane. He told the officer he was 22, not 23. My heart sunk into my feet, and I sat motionless while they explained to Kane that he missed a stop sign and that they're letting him off with a warning. They told me to get home, and I nodded my head. When we pulled off, I let my emotions take over and started screaming at the stranger I was sitting next to. Why would you lie to me? What the fuck is wrong with you? He looked distressed from the volume of my yelling and told me to calm down, that he was sorry he lied. He said he only lied about his identity for his own safety. That completely baffled me, considering he had just assaulted me. I screamed at him all the way to my house, and as we pulled in, I threw the car doors open and started throwing my stuff out onto the lawn, desperate to just get far away from him. He tried to talk to me, to offer more pitiful excuses for his disgusting actions, but I screamed at him to get the fuck away from me and that I never wanted to see him again. I gathered my stuff off the lawn and hauled it into my room while my parents slept soundly, unaware of the terrible secret I had. I woke my mom up, told her that I was home as she requested. Once I got into my room, I broke down. What happened to me was starting to sink in. As I was sobbing silently into my blanket, my phone lit up from a text from Kane. It read, I'm sorry about what happened. I really am. If it makes you feel any better, I just got pulled over, so this is my karma. Let me know if you want to talk. I felt a wave of nausea hit me like a train. I screenshotted the message, blocked his number, and deleted his contact. I haven't heard from him since, and I haven't hung out with anyone since besides my boyfriend, who, thank God, is normal. I still think about what happened almost every day, and I still feel sick when someone I don't know gets close to me, even if it's just a stranger passing by in the grocery store. I don't know that what happened was the product of my own irrational teenage actions. I do know I shouldn't have met up with someone I don't know, but I had faith that he would be a normal person, somewhat at least. I wished I would have listened to my instinct and to my parents' warnings. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't make up that police story, and I don't even want to think about it. I will never meet up with someone I don't know again. While trying to cope with what happened to me, I googled Ninham Mountain again. I found a link that said Kane Mountain North Trail Loop, New York. If you made it this far, or you take anything away from this story, please let it be this. Trust your instinct. Trust your gut. If anything feels wrong, it probably is. Don't meet up with strangers, no matter how good they look or how normal they seem. This was a lengthy story, and I apologize for that. It was hard for me to share after all this time, after carrying this secret for this long. I am doing this in hopes that it inspires someone out there to follow my advice and keep themselves safe. What happened to me was disgusting and horrible, and I never wanted to happen to anyone else again. That being said, Kane, let's not meet again. Fuck you, and I hope you're rotting in jail or hell right now. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, creepy, let's not encounters. Before I go on any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Blaze, Kami Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klemko, and Haunted. Again, thank you all so much for being the pillars of which this channel 
rests upon. My heart and my gratitude will forever be thankful. Thank you all so much for being the largest supporters of the channel. To the other subscribers, to the listeners, or for anyone who is new here that peeked in to check out the channel, thank you so much for your support. For without you, there would not be me, and I wouldn't have a voice, and there would not be a Back to Ashes. I can't express my gratitude enough. Thank each and every last one of you for tuning in. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please keep yourself safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.